Good morning, everyone uh, in the UK. Good afternoon to everyone in Kazakhstan. Uh, welcome to this British Kazakh Society webinar. Uh, first of a series of webinars on Kazakhstan at 30. And I'm delighted uh, that we have this morning uh, Mr. Grigory Marchenko as our uh, main speaker, um, who will be talking about the history of finance in an independent Kazakhstan. Um, now, before uh, we go on to our presentations, there are a couple of messages from key members of our British Kazakh society who couldn't be with us here uh, live today, uh, but they've both sent video messages. My name is Rupert Goodman, and as chairman of the British Kazakh Society, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all to this special BKS event on finance. We're particularly honored to have two such distinguished international financiers speaking to us today. The first is Grigory Marchenko, who needs no introduction. He's been twice chairman of the National Bank of Kazakhstan, he has also been first Deputy Prime Minister of Kazakhstan and is currently a, a special advisor to the EBD. Secondly, we have Jürgen Rinktering, who is the first Vice President of the EBRD. I welcome them both. I would like to give special thanks to Roger, David and Jeff and our membership services manager, Jean Tois, for all their organisation of this special event. This event falls squarely within the remit of the BKS, whose aim is to act as a conduit between two, the two countries. And we cover all aspects of the bilateral relationship. So without further ado, again, I offer my welcome to both speakers and look forward to a tremendous event. Thank you very much indeed. Member of the Chairman's Advisory Group, I am delighted to support the excellent work of the British Kazakh Society. The BKS is making a vital contribution to promoting and enhancing the bilateral relationship between the United Kingdom and Kazakhstan. I congratulate the Board, under the excellent chairmanship of Rupert Goodman and the staff, for the transformation and expansion of the Society's activities over recent years. It gives me great pleasure to welcome the series of high-level BKS webinars which are doing so much to highlight understanding and cooperation in trade, investment and culture between our two countries. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite um, His Excellency Mr. Yerlan Idrisov, the Ambassador of Kazakhstan to the United Kingdom and the uh, Honorary President of the British Kazakh Society um, to send his greetings and, and welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Uh, Roger, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, dear all, good morning uh, to everyone. I'm very happy uh, to be with you today. Thank you for joining us. I also welcome uh, those who attend uh, our uh, webinar uh, through other means. It is uh, uh, quite a great uh, pleasure and honor to open this uh, event. Uh, uh, British Kazakh Society is, uh, uh, one can say, is my brainchild. Uh, I remember uh, 2002, 2003, the late uh, 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 Lord Fraser, uh, Ro Rupert and others, uh, we have uh, come to this idea and uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, in the approach of the next year, the year of the 30th anniversary of Kazakhstan, uh, uh, British Kazakh Society came up with this idea of having a series of webinars, uh, Kazakhstan at 30. Uh, we are now uh, rounding up uh, the uh, uh, very crazy and unwelcome uh, year of pandemic. Uh, we are looking uh, into the future, into the post-pandemic world, and I think uh, it is uh, quite befitting uh, that uh, we have this webinar opening 
uh, um, on the topic uh, which uh, is one of the most important pillars of Kazakhs, uh, Kazakhstan's independence. As you know, uh, early 90s were uh, absolutely critical uh, for our survival. Uh, very few gave us, uh, bet, uh, gave us uh, good bets for survival, uh, but uh, uh, we have persevered, uh, we have uh, 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 pursued very uh, serious reforms in uh, different aspects of life. And economy, of course, was crucial. And within the economy, financial sector was absolutely uh, critical. And it so happened that uh, Mr. Marshinka, who needs no introduction, uh, has uh, come into the center of all those uh, uh, financial reform efforts. Uh, uh, he is widely credited to, uh, with the setting uh, of one of the uh, best regulated and uh, most efficient and successful and transparent financial system in Central Asia. That goes without uh, any doubt. Uh, he was at the center of uh, key uh, elements of uh, building our financial system, the insurance uh, uh, institutions, securities, pension fund, of course. Uh, pension fund is his brainchild, and uh, I think uh, uh, it shows uh, today that it is uh, those decisions were uh, forward-looking in those uh, early days of our independence. I'm uh, also particularly uh, happy that uh, I personally, as we uh, uh, exchanged at the very beginning informally, I know uh, Mr. Marchinka for many years. We, are, we hail from the same school in Almaty. We hail from the uh, same institute in Moscow. And uh, I um, uh, was with him in the government for many years. Uh, I was on the foreign policy front and Grigory Marchinka was twice, as Rupert said, uh, heading the uh, uh, central bank. I think uh, it is quite befitting uh, that uh, we open this seminar uh, because uh, President Tokayev uh, is uh, absolutely uh, eager uh, to uh, press with reforms. As you know, uh, he recently has established a new institution called uh, uh, the Supreme Council of Economic Reforms. Uh, it is uh, quite uh, symbolic uh, that uh, with uh, Jurgen's presence today uh, that uh, Suma Chakrabarty Sir Suma Chakrabarty has been uh, asked to uh, serve as the deputy uh, chairman of the Supreme Council by President Tokayev. So uh, by uh, going back into the history, I think uh, this is a very good exercise to understand what we need to do in the future. Uh, we are very proud that we have achieved, achieved so, so many things, but uh, as we say, we do not want to rest on laurels. We do understand that a lot more is to be done. So by uh, revisiting those early uh, uh, steps which we did as an independent nation, I think uh, we'll be able to better understand uh, what challenges lie ahead and what we need to do to uh, make sure that we achieve those uh, very ambitious goals of the 2050 strategy of Kazakhstan. I'm also glad that uh, despite of this pandemic year, uh, the embassy and Kazakhstan was quite uh, visible and busy here. Uh, not a single week uh, went without our uh, online presence uh, on different topics political, foreign policy, economic culture, history. And now we are ushering up uh, the Kazakhstan 20 uh, uh, line uh, in our activities. I hope that many of those activities next year will go offline, uh, but uh, online gives many more uh, uh, new benefits and advantages. As I said yesterday, we had the big three hour almost uh, intergovernmental uh, economic commission uh, session with two ministers chairing the meeting. and. Uh, um, it gathered more than 200 people. Uh, and uh, if we had this seminar webinar offline, of course, we wouldn't be able to gather so many people. Therefore, I welcome all the attendees and participants of this event. I'm absolutely sure that uh, Grigory Marshinki will give us a, a brilliant overview of the early uh, steps in our economic uh, and financial reforming. And of course, uh, I hope that uh, future webinars, uh, which we continue, uh, we will kick off a webinar with uh, Mike Gifford, Ambassador of Britain in Kazakhstan in early January. Then we have uh, uh, um, uh, a visit to judicial reforms uh, with Marat Bikitaev, the Justice Minister, and many others. So I thank uh, all the participants uh, uh, for this event. Uh, of course, uh, I wish you every uh, success and uh, very enjoyable uh, festive season which is coming. Uh, and our Kazakh uh, and British friends, and the British Kazakh Society, I uh, congratulate with approaching uh, Independence Day of Kazakhstan, the 29th Independence Day of Kazakhstan on the 16th of January. 
Thank you very much and uh, please enjoy our event. Grigori, once again, welcome to our webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yelan. And um, I think now straight over to uh, Mr. Grigori Marchenko. Uh, you have 30 minutes to cover the entire history of finance in Kazakhstan. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I actually, uh, good morning everyone. I actually made 15 points on which Kazakhstan was the first in the former Soviet Union or we did things differently. So basically that gives me uh, two minutes for every point, though each of them requires probably several <coughs> uh, minutes at least. But I would like to start to explain uh, why it worked in Kazakhstan in 1990s and how it all started. And basically there are lots of explanations uh, why uh, uh, financial sector reforms or economy reforms in any given countries are successful. But in general, there are four key factors. Number one and most important is political will. And we had this political will then because President Nazarbayev was really keen uh, to make these uh, reforms. Number two is uh, having a group of reformers and not just a bunch of uh, professors uh, which have uh, nice suggestions, uh, but a group of people in uh, Ministry of Finance, in the government proper, in the central bank, which would not only uh, propose these reforms, but only uh, also be, will be willing and ready to carry them through. The third uh, issue is also very important and in many countries it is mostly important is bureaucracy. So if bureaucracy, especially on the regional level, is conducive to these reforms, then they will not succeed. But if they start blocking us, sabotaging these reforms, which is the case or was the case in uh, several neighboring countries, uh, they would be and not uh, successful. And the fourth area is uh, the, the need of explanatory work. Uh, you need to convince uh, uh, the people of the value and benefits of your reforms because usually people are very, uh, I mean, psycho psychologists know it uh, and express it much better than me. People are, are not willing to accept reforms. They, most of the people prefer sta status quo uh, because reforms could uh, uh, change things for the better. That's what usually the governments uh, are promising, but they also could change things for worse. And that's what of, uh, happens quite often as well. But in Kazakhstan, we had political will. Uh, we had the group of reformers in uh, different parts of the government and the central bank. We had bureaucracy then, which was a mixture of old school uh, Soviet bureaucracy and uh, a substantial amount of uh, newcomers like Mr. <laughs> Idrisov and myself and few other people. And uh, the population was accepting the need for reforms because we all understood that uh, we cannot live uh, as we did in the Soviet Union times because the economy is completely different now and the Soviet Union as a country has broken up. And uh, if we're talking about finance sector, the whole story basically starts in 1993 with the introduction of our national currency, Tenge because basically that's where the, the group of reformers uh, actually uh, uh, was uh, created because Mr. Simbaev, who was then uh, uh, the governor of the central bank, uh, was head of the working group and Mr. Jandosov, who was after him the governor of the central bank and myself, and also two other gentlemen, Mr. Shukeev, who is currently uh, the governor of southern Kazakhstan and Mr. Nazarov, who is retired now, uh, were the group of people who was uh, basically presenting the whole effort. And uh, after Tenge was successfully introduced in November of 1993, and we still have November 15th as our professional holiday for financiers, and as a day of a national currency, Mr. Simbaev, uh, then Mr. Jandosov, Mr. Damitov in April, and myself in June of 1994, after graduating from Georgetown 
uh, university special program. We all met in uh, Central Bank and actually that's where all these reforms were then uh, developed and uh, uh, implemented. And I would like to uh, uh, stress that it, it is always a team effort. Unfortunately, people and especially the media have all these uh, theories about a hero in the crowd and about a single individual changing things for the better. That never works. Uh, the whole 20th century and 21st as well is a century of institutions, organizations, uh, you name it. So the, the key is to have a proper team at the top of an institution and this team should build or rebuild or reset this institution and that's precisely what happened uh, in the National Bank in 1994-1995 under the leadership of Mr. Simbaev. Uh, so he should be talking <laughs> instead of me today but unfortunately he is 85 now and he's not pe making public appearances and he doesn't speak uh, English very well. So, uh, after that we were uh, facing a very difficult test because in January 1994 the government pushed so-called uh, uh, settlement of uh, inter-enterprise debt. The central bank was against it, I was then at Georgetown, uh, but uh, this whole uh, exercise was still done irrespective of uh, unwillingness of the central bank to support it. And there was a, a huge amount of money given as a loan to the companies, uh, thinking that uh, thinking is always good, uh, intentions are always good. Uh, so the idea was that the company should be repay debts to each other. So inter-enterprise debt would be cleared and we'll be living in a much uh, happier uh, world uh, uh, but uh, the uh, truth was completely different. Within three months, Tenge, our currency, fell from 11 to 40, Tenge per dollar. Uh, and uh, uh, inflation uh, skyrocketed. So when I came back in June 1994, monthly CPI, not annual, but monthly was 46%. And so we as a central bank had to rebuild uh, this whole uh, situation, the uh, corporate sector and mostly state-owned or newly privatized companies were really uh, looking for money and they were demanding loans and whatever rates. So we had first uh, uh, so-called government guaranteed program because our government strongly believed that they could select the projects and uh, uh, the companies would repay uh, the loans uh, offered by the central bank with the government guarantee. Six months later, they found out that 83% of the companies defaulted uh, on these loans and the government had to repay us money. So that taught them a lesson about uh, uh, market discipline on one side about importance of having an independent uh, uh, central bank. Then we introduced program of uh, auctioned loans whereby commercial banks were participating in a competitive tender uh, for a limited amount of funds and whoever was offering the higher uh, uh, price uh, was getting this money but it was already a market-based system uh, but the big reforms came in 1995 when we uh, pushed through a new law on the central bank and a new law uh, on a banking system. And in accordance with this uh, legislation, we introduced international uh, standards uh, both in supervision, then it was Basel I, and we also changed the international, we introduced international accounting standards and we introduced an up-to-date uh, uh, payment system. So all the banks had to increase their uh, capital and to prove that they are a viable institution. Uh, many of them were not able to do so. And in 1995, 1996, we revoked uh, 110 licenses. I was then responsible for the banking supervision. So it was very difficult and painful 
exercise, but it was necessary to be done. So we cleaned up the banking system. After that, there was a uh, period of uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions, and there were around 45 mergers and acquisitions. So the banks were uh, growing larger and more economically uh, strong. And so when we started the whole process in 1993, there were 230 banks. When we finished it in uh, 1997, uh, there were about 47, 48 uh, banking licenses uh, in the country. But that made our system healthy. We were the first uh, to, to introduce both international accounting standards, the new payment system with T plus three settlement and uh, uh, the new standards of banking supervision in all of uh, CIS countries. Uh, also in 1994, we kick-started the government bonds market, which was uh, non-existent before. We created uh, the market for so-called NBK loans, uh, because uh, uh, government uh, bonds uh, were three months, uh, six months, and 12 months. And uh, if uh, banks wanted to, to sh have shorter maturity, we offered them notes of the central bank. And it also worked very nicely. So the banks had an opportunity to park some of their funds with these uh, securities. Uh, the payment system was also very important. And in 1996, we made a breakthrough uh, when we placed the first sovereign euro bond uh, on the market. That was done with the bank which Jurgen used to work for <laughs> in 1990s in Kazakhstan. So there are always some issues which are uniting us and some issues where uh, people were working together on. And it was successful, but uh, I was part of the roadshow and I still remember that there were at least a dozen of American investors who asked me to show Kazakhstan on the map. And two of them even brought the globe or a globe to a meeting and uh, asked me to show where Kazakhstan is on a globe. And it was <laughs> quite funny, but nevertheless, all these people bought our bonds and it was a successful issue and there were, were others. And uh, But in general, what I would like to underline, there were lots of things uh, that we have done in 1990s, which were not done before and nobody helped us. Uh, there are always advisors, but uh, there is a limit to how far they can go and uh, what can they tell you. Uh, then very important uh, area was definitely pension reform. Uh, it just happened then uh, when I was uh, uh, on a leave, uh, our parliament uh, uh, adopted a legislation in 1996 uh, saying that we should have a voluntary pension funds in our country. And the then Governor Jandosov agreed to that, <laughs> which I was not aware of. But then things were done quickly and sometimes legislation took only several days to be adopted. But after looking at this issue in some detail, uh, we realized that voluntary funds uh, would not work in a country like Kazakhstan and we thought uh, that probably one only one to two percent of population would uh, put their money into such funds and actually there was uh, an experiment done by a neighboring country because there was a voluntary pension fund created uh, in Kyrgyzstan uh, and uh, yes uh, within uh, 20 years they had one less than one percent of population committing money to a voluntary pension fund. So we decided uh, to, to create a mandatory accumulatory system. Uh, we were helped with the World Bank loan uh, and the Asian Development Bank loan and people started paying 10% of their salary into a, a, a mandatory, uh, as a mandatory contribution to a pension fund of their choice. Then, uh, much later, all these private pension funds were unified into a single uh, pension fund. But what's important, we have uh, uh, 25 uh, billion uh, dollars accumulated in these accounts. Uh, there is interest uh, accumulated on these accounts and both contributions and interest accumulated are tax free. 
So uh, over long term, we can say that uh, introducing this accumulative pension system uh, was uh, a big success. Uh, the next area was the securities market reform, which was done in 1997, uh, and the so-called blue chips uh, uh, program, where we were thinking about uh, private, private, partially privatizing several large government uh, uh, held uh, uh, companies. There was a big interest from investment uh, funds uh, uh, worldwide and uh, um, um, by the end of the day, the government decided that uh, they are not uh, willing to, to sell uh, stakes in uh, oil companies or in Kazakh Telecom and this whole program uh, unfortunately uh, never fully materialized and as a result of that I resigned as a chairman of the Securities Commission in 1997 but I still believe that it was a sensible uh, program and it's a pity that it never fully materialized. Uh, then uh, what was important and also we were, were the first in our area was the introdu introduction of deposit insurance for uh, public deposits which was done in the year 2000 and uh, that was made uh, as one of the uh, sort of uh, major objectives of my second term as a governor and there was a very widespread skepticism and uh, when this whole scheme was proposed the overall volume of population deposits in the banking sector was 311 million dollars. Uh, so now it's also about 25 billion, sometimes it rises to 27, sometimes it goes down to uh, 23 billion, but also if you compare us to the country like Uzbekistan, which is a more pure, populous country to the south, overall population deposits there are around 2 billion dollars, so more than 10 times lower than in Kazakhstan. So the creation of deposit insurance fund was definitely, fir okay, first the consolidation of the banking sector and the removal of all the weak banks was very important. And secondly, creation of deposit insurance fund uh, for the remaining banks. And it clearly worked because in some countries they do it in reverse. They first create deposit insurance fund and then they start cleaning up the banking sector. Uh, as they, for instance, did in Russia. And I think that uh, our approach is much less uh, costly. Uh, there were also, uh, we uh, started developing the mortgage market, created as a government funded backstop Kazakhstan insurance company. And we created a government owned bank, uh, which is called, uh, uh, construction savings banks but basically it's what is in England is called building society and in Germany is called uh, uh, Bausparkasse. So basically which what people should realize what we were doing in Kazakhstan and all these financial sector reforms was either uh, adopting international standards where they were available like Basel one and uh, uh, banking supervision or international accounting standards and not uh, gap in uh, accounting, but where they are not available, we're applying the best international practices like this Bausch Parkassen in, in this area, or we were also using the experience of uh, the Japanese postal saving system for developing uh, Kazakh post. So either international standards or best international uh, practices and this is another area which uh, worked uh, uh, reasonably well. Um, also what was important and what was uh, done, uh, uh, we made a visit to Norway in December 2000 and technically it was created to 2000, in 2002 and we were the first again in CIS is uh, to create a national fund or as it's sometimes called the National Petroleum Fund, which uh, 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 sometimes it's called Future Generations Fund, but uh, currently in Kazakhstan it's actually uh, quite actively used and they do an annual transfer to support our budget. 
And this was an absolutely correct decision. And uh, this national fund is very important uh, in several uh, areas and we are quite proud. We went to Norway, Mr. Isinbaev, who was then our uh, finance minister, myself, uh, deputy uh, minister of justice. And actually we used the Norwegian model, again, best international practices to, to create our uh, national fund. And uh, basically I would like to stop here because I would like to leave some time for Jurgen and uh, some time for questions because uh, as I've been involved in that for many, many years, there are lots of issues that I could uh, talk and uh, uh, I, I would like to stop myself. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grigori. That's uh, very kind of you to allow uh, Jürgen extra time. So <laughs> over to you, Jürgen. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, I believe that the last time I saw Grigory was, uh, must have been more than 13 years ago at a, uh, at a wedding when he was sitting at the table. And I have to say after 13 years, I mean, he's still as, as fascinating as uh, when I remember him. But um, anyhow, good morning also from my side. Thank you very much for your very kind uh, invitation. It actually made me pause for a moment to reflect. Yes, indeed, um, Kazakhstan has a very special place in my heart. As I worked and lived over three years in Almaty in my capacity, and Grigory already referred to that as chairman of Avinemo Bank, Kazakhstan. And I have to say, I keep very happy memories about my time in the country. In fact, over the years I spent in the country, I gained many friends and I'm fortunate to be reconnecting with many of them now in my capacity as EBRD's first vice president. Um, one of them is, by the way, is our moderator uh, of today, Roger Holland, who I probably would not have recognized if I would have bumped into him in a supermarket here in London. But um, ladies and gentlemen, since its independence in 91, Kazakhstan has made indeed immense progress. With EBRD playing a small but important role in helping the country over these three decades of success. As of today, the bank EBRD is the country's largest foreign investor. Of course, outside the oil and gas sector with total investments of over 8 billion euros, of which more than two thirds, by the way, are in the private sector. In order to promote foreign direct investments, the Kazakhstani Foreign Investors Council was established in 1998. EBRD has had the honor of co-chairing the council since its inception, with our new president, Odile Renaud Bassol, co-chairing with your president, Kasim Yomar Tokayev at the most recent meeting only a few weeks ago. And yes, I also had good memories of the FRC myself, as AB Nemro Bank was one of the FRC members during my time in the country. And in fact, at a certain point in time, I found myself co-chairing the Image Enhancement Working Group, looking at things like multiple entry visas, um, etc. Anyhow, Interestingly, as many as seven out of the current 37 members of the FIC are MDBs or foreign financial institutions, including banks like Citi and JP Morgan, reflecting possibly the role of the financial sector uh, is playing in the integration of Kazakhstan into the world economy. Sadly, however, compared to the day when I was living in the country, there's a much reduced presence of full service global foreign banks in the country with, uh, I believe, Citibank, the only global financial institution remaining, in addition, of course, to uh, several Russian and uh, Chinese banks active in the country. This also after the departure of the first foreign bank licensed in uh, operations in Kazakhstan, my, uh, my own Avon Emerald Bank, after the failed acquisition by RBS just before the financial crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, the EBRD has played a tangible role in the makeover 
of a limited number of local financial institutions, microfinance and leasing companies. The sector has come a long way since our first project in 1993. It was a hundred million dollar credit line to the National Bank with a sovereign guarantee for unlending through local private participating banks to small and medium enterprises. We are particularly proud of our products that are tailor-made for the financial sector to reach micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as, by the way, women in business program. Yes, indeed, across all regions of Kazakhstan, entrepreneurs and businesses benefit from lending facilities provided by the EBRD via six partner banks and microfinance organizations. In the past five years, we provided over 250 million euros in local currency for unlending to micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. They also received technical assistance to enhance their operation and have a hands-on experience of the EBRD. Many of these enterprises are led by female entrepreneurs supporting our goal to increase gender inclusivity and improve women's access to finance. This is the area where I'm pleased to say EBRD excels and where our work will have an impact not only now but for decades to come. Looking ahead, um, the EBRD is reinforcing its position as a leader in green finance. In fact, only recently we approved a 26 million euro frame, million framework to support progress towards a low carbon and resilient future in Kazakhstan, with the proceeds being channeled once again by commercial banks and microfinance organizations. We're also glad to see work expanding beyond the banking sector, with um, the uh, AIFC gaining momentum and next steps being taken to develop the domestic market. The AIFC has attracted foreign shareholders, as you probably all know, introduced modern trading technologies, brought English law to Central Asia for the first time, and proved itself capable to, of performing the most complex financial transactions. Another important part of our work related to the financial sector has always been to maintain close partnership with the financial sector regulator and the National Bank, working on such areas as um, improvement of derivatives legislation, creating credible interbank reference rates, and development of the MPL sales framework, MPLs, non-performing loans, of course. And then came 2020, and we were confronted with a global health crisis, which in turn caused serious disruptions and economic problems. Amid this uncertainty and in response to the urgent financing needs, EBD was the first multilateral development bank to launch a so-called solidarity pact, an emergency crisis response, initially for 4 billion euros. And even the date of the package unveiling, this was Friday, March the 13th, did not stop us. And since the beginning of this year, EBD has already committed in excess of 420 million for the benefit of Kazakhstani companies, with most of it going to the private sector. The work continues, but already over 6,000 local uh, uh, MSMEs benefited from this financing, enabling them to preserve their business and working places and helping to protect the achievements and hard work of the last few years. There's a common knowledge that it is remarkably difficult to obtain support in a crisis situation. Also, there's a popular consensus that a banker is a fellow who lends you an umbrella when the sun is shining, but wants it back the minute it begins to rain. I want to assure you, however, that EBRD bankers are different, and we are committing almost all our activity this year and next to counter the impact of the pandemic and support the economic recovery in Kazakhstan. Ladies and gentlemen, back in the dark days of March, at the beginning of the lockdown, I told the world, we are with you. And also would like to repeat these words now here. Yes, we are with you. You, our clients, our partners. We are with the people of Kazakhstan to learn from our past experiences and preserve the gains we have made together 
and to rise to the challenges of tomorrow. Rachmet, or thank you, and over to you again, Roger. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Um, we now have um, some questions, um, which I'm going to take a selection of, and feel free, these are not uh, necessarily for specifically for Mr. Marchenko or, or for Jürgen, this, uh, please, please feel free um, to comment and uh, reply if you think it's appropriate. But, but this one um, I will address to Mr. Marchenko uh, first. Um, uh, Mr. Marchenko, you oversaw uh, the combination of the former monetary and supervisory authorities in, um, in around 2011. Uh, do you think it was the right thing to split them again? Uh, we now have a separate monetary authority, the NDK, and a separate super supervisory authority, the Agency of the Republic of Kazakhstan for L Regulation and Development of Financial Market. Um, could you could you get answer that one? Of course. Uh, I, actually, I do believe that they should be separate, and I uh, also said that uh, publicly. And uh, the original understanding was that we would first uh, combine all types of financial supervision within the central bank, which we did from uh, 2000 to 2003. And uh, there was a separate uh, financial supervision agency, uh, which was separated from the central bank uh, in 2004. But then, uh, around 2010, uh, the president uh, had this idea uh, that they should be combined again. We were against it, but uh, again, when I was on a business trip, <laughs> the presidential decree was signed uh, without my uh, sort of involvement or approval or whatever, and uh, then they were merged again. Uh, which was not uh, the way to do. And I think that when it was separated again, uh, it was clearly the, uh, the correct move. But uh, it still beats me uh, why it was uh, reunified in 2011 or what for. Thank you. It, it, it seems to me it's, it's not a good, good idea to take a holiday if you're a national bank uh, chairman. Yeah, but then you won't have any holidays within several years, brother. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. Okay, um, uh, did you want to comment on that, Jürgen? I'm perfectly happy with uh, Gregory's uh, reply. Okay. okay, that's fine. Um, we had um, a question uh, from one of our old friends, uh, um, Richard Lewington, former uh, ambassador, British ambassador to Kazakhstan, who was there from 1999 to 2002. Uh, that was just really asking about uh, the national national oil fund and its development and growth and uh, efficiency. And um, um, perhaps you just comment generally about how the fund's been operated and run. And uh, you know, is it is it doing the job it, it should do or was supposed to do? And I had. A question to add on to that myself and um, in that is there a, is there a role for uh, similar city funds uh, as opposed uh, in addition to uh, a national country fund and that comes from the fact that there are a few good examples around the world of cities that have um, declared themselves bankrupt and I'm just wondering that on the um, revenue side on the generating revenue side whether cities could become more financially responsible as opposed to just the cost and expense side thank you okay but these are actually two questions on the national find i mentioned that uh, it was the idea was conceived in the year 2000 then after several visits and uh, discussions we decided to uh, create a national fund uh, based on the Norwegian uh, model whereby it's not, a, uh, in our case, it's not a separate legal entity. It's just basically an account of Minister of Finance with the central bank and it's managed by the central bank uh, along with other assets. Uh, so I'm 
whether it's used properly or not currently, uh, I don't want to answer that because I haven't been involved for the last uh, uh, seven years and I don't want to criticize the ways of the uh, current government or current uh, central bank. But uh, the way it was uh, conceived or anticipated and developed uh, was, uh, I think, uh, the proper way then in early earlier this uh, uh, century. Second question about municipal finance is actually a very good question. Differently from Russia, United States or Germany, Kazakhstan is not a federal country. Uh, we are unitary. And actually I mentioned that there was a market of the of municipal bonds in late 1990s and uh, actually we I was then working at Deutsche Bank Securities in Kazakhstan and we did uh, uh, four of the first five issues of different provinces but then the Minister of Finance intervened and said that no uh, if uh, uh, regions want to do something they should come to us and they would have their uh, uh, system of inter-budgetary transfers. So those uh, cities like Almaty, which always has an excess, uh, we have our money taken out uh, <laughs> for, for 23 years now uh, into the central budget and then it's redistributed. Uh, so, but uh, there are definitely several uh, provinces and uh, several cities which could and should have funds uh, like you mentioned, Roger, but in that case, they would not be contributing to the Republican budget with all the repercussions which our uh, government uh, wants to avoid. So yes, theoretically, you are right. And that brings uh, more discipline for your uh, funding. And also it helps you to explain to the public what you're using the funds for. Also uh, municipalities or provinces could uh, issue specific bonds, okay? You want your proper uh, garbage collection and processing. Let's uh, place some bonds in the market and all this money definitely under supervision of the public or specifically elected uh, people. That could be very helpful for the city origin development, but uh, so far it's not the case in Kazakhstan. Uh yeah, thank you very much, uh, Grigori. Jürgen, if you could, uh, you wanted to comment on the National Fund. Yeah, I think in, in, in general, I very much agree with, uh, with Grigori. Of course, the National Fund setting it up um, uh, was a good, very good thing. And let's remember why actually uh, the country did it, to actually avoid what people uh, call the Dutch disease, actually to make sure that the rest uh, of the economy uh, uh, remains competitive or becomes competitive. Um, has that been achieved? Uh, possibly not in its entirety, but there we also have to understand the limitation of Kazakhstan as a country. Uh, it's fair to say, I mean, uh, Gregory mentioned the, uh, the, the financial reforms, but we also shouldn't forget that Kazakhstan was, was one of the first uh, with the economic reforms in, uh, um, in, uh, in, in the region. Um, but given the scale of the, of the, the, the country, uh, it's the seventh largest country, as we all know, and only a, a population like in the Netherlands, certain production will, will, will never actually take place in, uh, in, in Kazakhstan. Um, having said that, um, actually we see the value of the, the, the National Oil Fund uh, right now. Uh, it is particularly in these kind of circumstances with COVID, um, where, which has meant that the fund actually uh, gave the necessary firepower to, uh, let's call it in English, to soften the blow of the, the, the current economic crisis. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we have here, let's see, um, this, this is addressed to uh, Mr. Marchenko. Thank you. For yeah, Roger, question. if I could intervene, there are over a dozen questions, but this is one I, I like. And also it's connected to what Jurgen was saying. And that's the only one in Russian. And it asks uh, where, why there was no a female governor 
uh, in uh, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, governor of the central bank, and uh, whether there were no uh, good candidates. Of course, there were good candidates, and actually, there were at least two women candidates who are better than the last three governors of the central bank in my humble opinion but unfortunately it's not me who is appointing governors so if people were consulting me on that issue i would definitely uh, promote uh, one of these two uh, wonderful women to be the governor but uh, that's that's not the case and talking about uh, coming back to what i was saying about the accounting sector reform that was de facto done by uh, mostly by women uh, first uh, mrs uh, naila abdulina who was uh, uh, my deputy and then uh, saule rahmetova who was the chief accountant of the uh, national bank so uh, and a lot of other areas if you look at the central bank uh, 60 to 65 percent of the employees are, are women and it's a sort of female dominated institutions but uh, there was uh, never a female governor so and i i fully agree that uh, they there were and there are uh, candidates which could have been nominated okay it's sorry roger but please go with your schedule <laughs> uh, no 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 problem i mean please please answer uh, if, if i may uh, roger also on that one um Actually, I have to say, in that respect, Kazakhstan is, is quite far ahead compared to many other countries. Uh, also in the bank where I used to work, Avian Emerald, actually the most stable and the best deputies I had, these were female. In the, uh, the bank, uh, Gregory uh, worked for, uh, with uh, Halik Bank, actually was led by uh, a female CEO, and it is probably still considered as the best run and the most stable uh, bank in the country and there are many many other examples uh, also so i would say actually the female participation uh, is is very strong and they actually you also see them at very very senior positions particularly in the financial industry thank you uh, jürgen um yeah we have a couple of questions here related to um for both of you related to digital currencies and digital commerce. So uh, what do you think about the central bank's digital currencies? What is the possible development directions of the CBDCs? And, um, and for you, Jürgen, as well, uh, could you share the, your thoughts on EBRD's uh, support to member states in development of uh, digital commerce? Well, I actually, uh, we published recently an article with my former deputy, uh, Mr. Abin Biktasov, who is actually one of the fathers of our reform in the payment system sector, about uh, how Kazakhstan uh, uh, unfortunately failed to be the first country in the world to introduce central bank uh, digital currency in 2013. We uh, developed a draft legislation, uh, but uh, this legislation was blocked by the government because we cannot introduce legislation. Uh, I mean, as a central bank, we couldn't introduce legislation directly to the parliament. It should be done only by the government. So the government was not supportive uh, of that, uh, but uh, there is a big article. So th to those who are interested, uh, there is a, uh, a video on YouTube, which was placed about uh, 10 years, uh, eight days ago. And uh, there is also an article, but if necessary, I could give the uh, connection to that article to, to uh, because it's long, but it's in Russian. And actually I do recommend to read this article because it's very detailed and explains the whole history of how we came to that thinking and uh, how this area would be developed. But uh, in general, I do believe that uh, that's the way to go. And central banks, and especially in countries like Kazakhstan, should have uh, introduced uh, digital currencies uh, at least a couple of years back. 
uh, Grigori, thank you. If you could um, forward uh, maybe the link for that oh. article to uh, the British Kazakh Society and uh, we'll uh, disseminate that to those. Okay. Uh, Perfect, thank you. I think, Roger, you are on mute. My apologies, everyone. I muted myself. Um, this is a current, current uh, question, really, about the current situation. There's a question here. Uh, during uh, the last years, the National Bank of Kazakhstan is actively printing money to support the banks and different state programs. What is the impact of that on the real inflation in the country? Um. <laughs> uh, I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> Again, I, I mean, we were talking about glorious past and I'm more than happy with that. No, you should realize that I'm no, now working. If I were still an independent consultant, I would have answered. I'm working for a regional development bank in which uh, Ministry of Finance of Kazakhstan is one of the shareholders. So by our statutory documents, I am not supposed to comment on the current uh, developments. We do have an office of chief economist, Mr. Vinakurov, and they publish a lot of analytical information about member countries, including on that issues as well. So I suggest that people come to the page of uh, Eurasian Development Bank and, uh, and, and read these publications. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jürgen? Well, uh, maybe as a substitute, I will answer the previous question, which you asked me to uh, respond to, and that is on uh, the digitization. And actually, very interesting. Um, uh, I did I, I did mention uh, in my uh, short uh, speech two things we're focusing on, and that is green and inclusiveness. But actually, I should have added digitization, and this is in our uh, uh, strategy is actually one of the, the, the three pillars we're looking at. And actually, uh, honestly, this morning, I judged uh, 60 application for uh, within EBRD uh, for courses on Harvard and MIT to particular forward uh, uh, that. And uh, uh, this is also something, so when there are clients who have uh, good ideas, we have our own VCIP, Venture Capital Fund, uh, we active actively promote these kind of solutions and particularly in a country like Kazakhstan um, I already referred to it so widespread um, uh, f fintech and beyond actually can and and should play a, a much more important role than now thanks uh, thank you Jürgen um, uh, we um, we we are almost at a, a one hour limit now 12 o'clock but we can continue um, with question, questions and answers for another five to ten minutes for those of you who want to stay in the webinar you're most welcome to and so I will, I will just continue uh, if that's okay with you Grigori and Jürgen yeah ten more minutes is okay with me yeah okay Jürgen of course okay so we have here um, a question about uh, addressed to you, Mr. Marchenko, how can we restart economic growth in Kazakhstan similar to the growth rates seen in the 1990s and early 2000s? In your opinion, what share of that historical growth is attributable to the oil super cycle and the reforms alone? Uh, it's a very difficult question because oil prices uh, definitely play the role. Uh, but I think the, the overall package of reforms was uh, somewhat uh, more important. So in my humble judgment, I would say 60% reforms and 40% uh, oil prices. In order to restart this process, uh, you should have uh, the same components. You should have political will. You should have a group of reformers, younger. <laughs> and uh, hopefully brighter. Uh, you should have a properly functioning bureaucracy, uh, which would be uh, willing and able to push these reforms through. And you should have a proper explanation or 
PR campaign in order to sell this package to the public, which is this year's is much more difficult because I mean, after 29 years, nine years of some sort of reforms, population is growing more and more suspicious and some people don't like the word reform at all. So there is little doubt that in 1990s, it was easier and also absence of internet and social networks was also helpful for reforms because the <laughs> most of the people on uh, I mean are anti uh, reformist again because they have uh, uh, these ideas about uh, status quo. So I think that uh, uh, reset or the whole issue is possible, but it all depends on the people who are now in Astana, and I'm not one of them. I'm still in Almaty and quite thank happy. You. Thank you, thank you, Grigori. Yeah, I think it's no Sultan. <laughs> and yeah, you're, okay. <laughs> you're good. I have a friend of mine who was born in that city in 1950s, and the name was changed five times. So. Yes, yes. Um, and his passport <laughs> as well. Salinagrad. Yeah, first it was Akmolinsk, then it was uh, uh, renamed by Khrushchev uh, into Salinagrad in 1962. Then it was renamed Akmola. Then it was renamed Astana, and then it was renamed Nur Sultan. Roger, I'm, I'm not going to comment on the uh, on the name Astana or Nur Sultan. I leave that to the specialist. But uh, um, on on the growth rates, uh, let's face it, uh, growth rates are a function of many things. Uh, the first one, by the way, uh, and when I was in the country, the uh, the economic base was a much lower one, so it's easier to grow from. A lower base just by definition um, having said that uh, you do expect a country like Kazakhstan to uh, to grow much faster than let's uh, let's say a country in the Western world like the Netherlands Germany or, or, or certainly the, the UK um, and and for that uh, in addition to the political will uh, and the uh, the willingness to uh, to reform as Gregor already mentioned, I would also add, and this is probably the most important thing, at least if you want to attract foreign direct investment, and that is a, a, a stable uh, investment climate. And that, I think, has uh, set Kazakhstan apart during these last uh, 30 successful years, that it has been a much more stable investment climate than uh, many of the countries surrounding it. Thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. Another quick question. Um, Kazakhstan adopted uh, Basel I quite successfully and quickly. My question is, uh, is the National Bank ready for transitioning to Basel II or III? And if so, what are the challenges now? Uh, uh, that actually the question to the, uh, this agency for financial supervision and agency uh, and markets regulation, which is a separate entity now. Uh, as far as sort of, again, old times, uh, we did adopt Basel I. We didn't like Basel II uh, because it was not uh, properly thought through in our humble judgment. And the drawbacks of uh, Basel II were quite obvious during the 2008 crisis. And then uh, there was Basel III developed and uh, it's supposed to be introduced uh, by the agency, but I don't know about the current situation or the pro uh, pro or their progress in that area. But in general, yes, we should be moving uh, as a country towards Basel III now. Um, you, okay? Yeah, um, I, I don't think that it, uh, to be honest, it truly matters, uh, Basel I, II, Three, we are actually talking now in many countries about adopting uh, Basel IV, and that is always in response to something. So um, ba Basel, whatever regulations you have, that will not uh, save a banking system or a bank. What I would like to add here is it is about uh, corporate governance. It's about uh, stronger governance. It's also about independence uh, of banks. And, and these are areas, I would say, where Kazakhstan in the upcoming three, five, ten years 
uh, still has uh, some work to go. Thank you, Jürgen. Um, this is possibly the last one here. What's your view on the consolidation of the pension system into the MBK managed uni unified pension fund? Do you feel this is a better fit for pension fund co contributors mm -hmm. than a competitively and privately managed system? No, I think that uh, having uh, several private pension funds was a better arrangement. And again, this idea of unification didn't come from us. It came from uh, outside. So this unification of banking supervision uh, into the National Bank back in 2011 and unification of uh, uh, pension funds into single unit was coming from the government and not from us. We were, as a central bank, we were against both ideas, but unfortunately, uh, politically, they prevailed. May, may I add my support for that uh, view? Uh, it's not only what Gregu mentioned. I think it also um, was um, not very good for the development of local capital markets. Uh, As well. Mm -hmm. That was also a, a, a setback for that. So I think the implications were wider than just uh, what was mentioned. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jürgen. I think we'll just take uh, one more question. Um, Mr. Marchenko said that deposit insurance should be introduced only after cleaning the banking sector and having a strong supervision. However, uh, there were failures of BTA, then CASCOM and RBK and uh, Cessna Bank, not to mention some of the small out, smaller banks. Uh, the bailout cost for the government was many billions. What went wrong? What to do in the future? How to avoid this? Uh, first of all, this all happened uh, within the last 20 years. So uh, some of these issues, uh, I mean, uh, if I were the governor, uh, RBK Bank uh, would have had the license revoked. Cessna Bank would have had its license revoked. And uh, it's a complicated story. Each of these institutions uh, uh, has its own history. And there are reasons, um, not all of them are financial or economical uh, for the situation in and uh, around these institutions. But uh, basically what I was saying, I was saying about uh, the uh, restructuring of the banking sector in 1995-1997 and introduction of the deposit insurance fund in 2000. And both of these uh, processes were absolutely correct uh, ones. And uh, uh, the, the current situation, again, I'm not working in the central bank. I have not visited the premises of the central bank for over seven years, neither in Almata nor in Nur Sultan. So, and there are reasons for that. So, I don't agree with uh, uh, some things. I do support other things, but I don't want to talk publicly about this because that would for many people sound uh, something like the grass was greener and the girls were pretty in 1990s. Uh, so, I mean, what for? It doesn't bring us anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Grigori. Uh, Jurgen, any comment? Uh, the grass was probably greener than uh, indeed. Um, <laughs> but but uh, no, I, I <laughs> it's a very difficult uh, uh, subject, but I have to say that's probably the biggest failure uh, in the development of Kazakhstan is indeed what has happened in the banking system over the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, let me add to that. Uh, it's not only the, the, the local banks. Uh, we, we, we heard a few, uh, few examples, uh, but also the bank I used to work, um, where uh, I think many thought that for many emerging markets, the future was also of uh, having a, a strong uh, subsidiaries of the Abraham Emirates, the HSBCs, the whatever it is. Uh, the financial crisis have actually shown that many of these banks actually they're maybe not as stable as uh, as, as we thought before, and that when they need uh, need uh, capital, they actually take capital back from uh, the, the the many of their subsidiaries, uh, including uh, uh, Kazakhstan. And this was a particular condition when banks were rescued 
uh, where, uh, for example, when RBS was rescued, one of the conditions was, okay, but this money is for the UK economy and not for Kazakhstan and beyond. So um, I think uh, there the lesson is also don't rely too much only on foreign institutions. Uh, you need to have strong local or regional banking system indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we need to wrap up pretty soon. Um, thank you very much to Grigory Marchenko and Jurgen Richtering for their great uh, overviews, the, the history of finance in Kazakhstan. I'd just like to hand over to Ambassador Idrisov to make a few uh, comments before coming back to me. Uh, thank you very much, Roger. Um, uh, I think we had a very um, uh, engaging, very informative and uh, quite interesting discussion. As you all could see, uh, Grigory uh, Marchinka is no less uh, crisp and quippy uh, today than he was 30 years ago. Uh, and he uh, has clearly demonstrated that with a good sense of humor uh, and realism. I think uh, uh, it is, as I said at the outset, it is very important uh, that we revisit uh, those days when the, gre the grass was greener uh, and uh, to better understand uh, how we should keep uh, the new brighter colors for the grass in the future. That's very important. And the uh, financial sector as the one of the key pillars of the economy uh, is absolutely critical to that. And I think uh, uh, we need uh, independent uh, voice, independent advice uh, in the, uh, that sector, uh, along with uh, what uh, current uh, um, government is doing. So it is very important to have a debate. Uh, in the debate, we come to a uh, common understanding of things uh, which are important for all of us. We, after all, are babies uh, of one uh, nation and we do care uh, in a similar way uh, for the future of that nation. So I thank you with the uh, successful kickoff of uh, this uh, webinar series, uh, Kazakhstan at 30. I'm also particularly delighted to see uh, the wide audience. Uh, we have more than uh, about 100 attendees and among them I have a very uh, 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 pleasantly recognized uh, uh, my good friend, uh, Ambassador Lewington. He was exactly the ambassador in the, during the years of my first stint as foreign minister. I remember uh, he was the, uh, the only British ambassador who visited all the regions of Kazakhstan and, and met all the governors of Kazakhstan. So Richard, if you are still there, I welcome you. I hope you enjoyed your uh, uh, trip uh, and uh, stay uh, posting in Ecuador, uh, which, uh, where you went after Kazakhstan. I remember that very well. I also recognize with great pleasure Charles Bland. Uh, Charles Bland, uh, if you are there, uh, warm welcome to you because Charles was working for the British Gas then, uh, was uh, the first uh, British co-chair of the then uh, economic instrument we had between Kazakhstan and uh, the United Kingdom. It had a long name, uh, but uh, it was the first successful economic instrument which brought our cooperation closer. Today, it is replaced by a much more efficient and uh, bigger and formal uh, intergovernmental uh, uh, economic commission, uh, which uh, we had the seventh session yesterday, as I said. So I think uh, we all uh, are happy uh, to have this uh, very successful uh, kickstart uh, for, the, for, for the webinar. I'd like to thank uh, British uh, Kazakh society uh, for this initiative. Let's have more and more events. Uh, we have our own plan uh, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Kazakhstan next year. As uh, President Tokayev said uh, recently, we should not uh, uh, celebrate uh, the anniversary uh, aiming at Panjang and uh, uh, showy events, uh, but rather we should celebrate uh, the 30th anniversary with events of substance, uh, events of uh, importance, real, uh, realistic, practical importance uh, for the nation and its future. I would like to once again uh, to reiterate my congratulations with the Independence Day of Kazakhstan, which comes uh, uh, very soon on the 16th of December. This is a, a landmark event and uh, I hope uh, we will be coming back uh, with our memories uh, on this uh, uh, important day. And of course, uh, I wish everyone a very uh, successful, enjoyable uh, festive season. Let's uh, uh, step over this leap year. Uh, 2020 is a leap year, you know, by our uh, tradition, uh, we believe that leap years uh, are difficult years. So let all the uh, calamities and uh, uh, difficulties uh, be left behind in 2020 and we uh, step uh, 
robustly and with confidence uh, into the post-pandemic world uh, in 2021 and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yelman. I just need 30 seconds now just to remind everybody uh, that we continue our series of webinars in January. On the 13th of January, 30 years of diplomacy between Kazakhstan and the UK. And of course, uh, His Excellency Yelan Edrisov uh, will be speaking with uh, the British ambassador, together with the British ambassador in Kazakhstan, Michael Gifford. On the 19th of January, we have the education group. And on the 27th of uh, January, we have an agribusiness webinar focused on livestock. So like Yerlan, I'd like to say thank you to everyone. Uh, happy Independence Day to Kazakhstan on the 16th and a happy and healthy festive season to everyone. Thanks very much to everyone participating and particularly to our speakers, uh, Grigory Marchenko and Jurgen Richtering. Thank you all, everyone. Take care and goodbye. Bye-bye.